Um, so without further ado, uh, I would love to welcome two of my dear friends. Uh, I've worked with both uh, West and Shelley over the years, and I'm so excited to, to introduce them to you. Here they are. Hello. How are Hi. you guys? So good to see good you. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Uh, now you guys are joining us from, uh, well, nor you normally in normal times live in New York City, right? But now you're, uh, as many people have moved around, you're doing all your work from somewhere else, right? Yeah, we lived in, we've lived in Manhattan for about 13 years, and now we are in Greenville, South Carolina, where we're spending a COVID year here in South Carolina. Uh, but you're still able to produce a form of theater uh, in South Carolina for everybody all over the world. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, but so, uh, you know, I'd love to introduce your background a little bit to people. Um, I, you know, aside from your work with me, of course, you've done some big stuff. Uh, Wes and I go way back. We went to high school together and did comedy and theater and all sorts of stuff. And then Shelly, you and I have worked together on food videos and music videos. Um, but um, enough about me. Let's, uh, let's talk about you guys. I want to share some photos of some of your previous productions and, and just fill people in on, on, on your background in theater because before COVID, you guys were working pretty actively around the world, right? Yeah, before COVID, I had a show running in Bulgaria and I had a show running in um, Germany and then another show that I was developing in Poland and in Tokyo. Uh, and we, you know, we had shows running all around the country too. Airplay has been seen by over a hundred thousand people now in like 30 something wow. countries. And this is a uh, one of this is some of Shelley's uh, productions that you directed. Yeah, that's the world premiere of *A Doll's House* Part Two uh, by Lucas Nath from uh, South Coast Rep. Which so you we were before both... it moved to Broadway, right? You directed that's right. the pre-Broadway. I did. I did. Yeah. I did premiere it. Yes. Um. But we um, you, you'll get a sense. We both um, I directed a fair amount of new plays, new plays and new musicals. Um, and classics too, uh, but we had a, a busy year lined up full of all theater productions. Uh, so that, yeah, that, that's from Constant Wife at Denver Center. Um, kind of, kind of, we're working all over the country and around the world. Um, yeah, this, this, is, is some uh, I, this is a Shakespeare show I did, um, The Tempest, but this, this technology is uh, with Daniel Wurzel, who's an air sculpture that I did airplay with. Uh, but you can see, I sort of started in Shakespeare and moved to musicals and then went into circus. So I directed Big Apple Circus uh, twice and I directed the Cirque du Soleil musical Paramore um, on Broadway. And, uh, and this is a show called uh, Wingman I did with clowns. So, you know, I got into working with uh, clowns a lot through the circus world. And one thing about clowns is that if you've ever seen a circus or anything, they always use an audience volunteer. And the basic structure is always the same, right? Whatever they are doing with the audience volunteer, it's the same sort of beginning, middle and end. But whatever that audience volunteer brings them changes significantly throughout the circus you're seeing. You know, they might do something crazy and they might have a crazy thing they're wearing and that sort of sends it off in tangents. So we started thinking about how to do um, a show that sort of had an audience volunteer aspect to it and can be truly interactive. And that's, that's basically the relationship between actor and playwright and audience member in Artistic Stamp. Yeah, so, um, so I know you've got some photos to share with us. So Artistic Stamp is a brand new type of theater, but as we were talking about the other day, many people during the pandemic have created, ourselves included, have found ways to uh, do this virtually through the internet and using these tools, which I think has been really, really successful in many cases. But you guys went a different route completely. You, it kind of ignored, for better or worse, the technology and went backwards. Which we I did. Cool. We did. I mean, we are both as directors also directing a fair amount of um, Zoom based and Zoom alternative. Um, uh, productions and readings and development. Uh, but while we were sort of diving into that, we, we were like, are we going to cook up something in the AR world? Are we going to cook up something, you know, and, and we, we actually went, 
No, people are doing beautiful work and we're happy to be a part of that. And there's innovation there for sure. But we wanted to seize on the live in a way that, and the interaction in a, in a way that, you know, we are accustomed to in our work. We were sort of questing for how do we create an experience where, you know, when the audience laughs, the performer feels it, do you know? How, how do we make that happen? And also sort of how to share a physical space. We think that's, you know, there's live and in-person they say. So you can watch live, you know, you can watch Saturday Night Live, you can watch live Zoom, there's live shows called Bears Live sometimes, things like that. But you're never in person. You know you're not sharing the same physical space with them, which I think is what we love about theater. And uh, we were thinking, well, how can we do that in COVID? People can't gather together. And we sort of had this epiphany that an envelope and a sheet of paper can be a shared physical space. Even though it's not, you know, you're not in the same place in time, I have it in my hands, I write on it, I put it in an envelope and send it to you in that same thing you're taking out. So it feels like a shared space. And that gives a whole lot of options. You can perfume letters, you can add props, you can add scents, um, you know, you could add a, a, a recipe or seeds that you're gonna cook and you're gonna taste. There's all sorts of things that we felt like put us more into that theater live and in-person world. That's so cool. Well, well, walk us through a little bit through the, the slideshow. Uh, you guys were in uh, Las Vegas, right? In March when this all... Can I talk about that first? Everybody yeah. Was. So we were in, uh, we had this, you know, Shelly and I have 20 year careers and we had reached uh, our sort of most successful year that we've ever had. She had five uh, big shows coming up for this season. I had five big shows coming up and I was opening a show in Las Vegas um, and they flew there on Friday the 13th, the last Friday the 13th we had, which was March 13th. And we thought we were, so the plan was for our, our 10 year old and I um, to fly there and be there for two weeks of spring break while West was in rehearsal at Planet Hollywood. And then I was heading on to California to direct a show and they were gonna go back to New York. We thought that was the plan. Um, and then 48 hours after we arrived, the strip shut down. And in fact, the day before we flew, Broadway shut down. Um, so we, you know, in that early part, we thought, okay, um, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna take this time, and um, we're gonna rent an RV, and we'll go to the Grand Canyon, and in a week, you know, in a week we'll be back. He'll be back in rehearsal. I'll be back in rehearsal. Um, however, about four days into that journey, it became clear that we were not coming back <clears throat> anytime soon. Uh, and so we uh, opted to um, drive cross country instead of going back to Vegas and flying home. We, we, we took a little over two weeks with our son uh, and drove cross country <laughs> and ended up in South Carolina uh, where Wes's dad, we sort of sheltered while mobile. So we had been <laughs> able to quarantine and arrive safe at his dad's house. Uh, but it actually gave us a lot of time to think uh, about kind of what the next chapter might be. Yeah, we just kept heading east until we got to the ocean and couldn't go any further. Um, and during this time, of course, all of our shows got postponed and canceled. Everything we had, you know, every day we'd get another call from a producer, another call from an artistic director, and we're professional directors, you know, along with so many people in the arts, actors and playwrights, um, you know, if you look at it, they say that arts create, uh, contributes one and a half billion dollars to the economy, even more than sports, uh, cultural institutions, uh, nonprofit arts institutions. Um, and all of us are out of work. So we had this sort of epiphany and this, we have a little video here to give you um, a sort of sense of what this is. Uh, yeah. But we promise we will explain more about how it actually works after this. <laughs> It's imaginative. It's stepping back in time or leaping into the future. It is a love letter to love letters. It's an epistolary story. It's filled with the unexpected. It's a safe way to do theater from your home. It's for kids too. <laughs> so that is a little bit of um, 
of our playwrights and some of our uh, actors and some of our audience members sort of talking about the what what is artistic stamp? Because we had a tough time sort of defining it at the very beginning. Yeah. Um, we have a question right off the bat, if you guys don't mind. Um, Not at I all. Know, I, we haven't gotten into your development of it yet, but um, Andrew uh, remembers as a kid participating in some play-by-mail role-playing games. Like, Ooh, you know, yeah, Dungeons Andrew, you're on, you're, you're on to it. So yeah. Andrew, you know, I, I like Dungeons and Dragons too. And uh, we call ours plays by mail. Uh, cause I, I like uh, referencing that play by mail world, um, and that the sort of popularity of play by mail and our plays by mail definitely has an RPG environment to it because you are playing a character inside of these sort of, uh, you know, narratives and worlds that have been created by the playwright, but how your character interacts with the characters the playwright has created, uh, can fundamentally change the outcome of the story. So cool. I love it. Um, so yeah, we'll get more into how you guys came about that and how you enlisted playwrights. Oh, I guess here we go. Yeah, so. <laughs> so, at, so at the end of that RV trip, we landed in South Carolina. Um, we spent a chunk of time there. Do you want to talk about Orchard Project a little bit? Yeah, I was doing this liveness lab at Orchard Project with about 100 other theater workers. And it was all, what is liveness? We were trying to define it um in this age and it was you know everyone from all over the world and there were all these breakout rooms you could go into and everyone went into the vr breakout room or the zoom breakout room or the ar breakout room or all these other sort of rooms you could go to and i was like there was one room that said snail mail slash text plays uh slash email plays and i was like oh put me in that room and it was me and like two other people. Yeah, no, no, no one was in that room. No one was in that room. One <laughs> of those was well before was, COVID, um, right? No one was. No one right? was interested. One of them was Natalie Ann Valentine, who is a playwright now. Uh, another was Katie Chidesser, who's one of our actors. And we just started talking about, you know, letter writing and sort of the power of it. And when we were young and we would receive letters from friends or, you know, partners or you know girlfriend boyfriends or family members how much those letters meant and we've almost all saved them we've saved these handwritten letters for 20 years because it, they seem powerful they seem to almost bring that person back and all the emotions and they're so intimate and private and everything um and so we got really excited about what we could do if we created a show that took place in the form of handwritten letters delivered through the postal service that was interactive and immersive where the audience wrote back. And since the bulk of my career has been uh, developing new works and new plays, uh, then I, I sort of jumped in to, to think about what the architecture might be like uh, and what the process could be like working with playwrights in a form um, when you're sort of saying, okay, we haven't done this before. Who is game to jump into this adventure? We think we know how it works. Um, who's up for the experiment? Uh, and we started reaching out to these writers, starting with Natalie, who he had been in this um, breakout room with. And she's brilliant on a lot of things. I mean, we not, we did not do this, so <clears throat> don't get too excited. But she had one idea. What if we send people seeds in letter one, and then they have to grow a plant, and then they have to send like clippings of the plant back in letter six. Oh, wow. And all this was just in the development stage, but it was like, how can we make this more interactive, make you feel like you're more a part of the story? Um, we had we hired six writers. We commissioned them. Uh, so you know we're this is giving work to playwrights. It's giving work to actors and general managers and all this stuff. And now we're planning season two, where we're going to have three more uh, writers and three more new pieces involved. It's amazing. And you, uh, I think the next slide is about the actors. Is that right? Is yeah. That much? So uh, well, the, these are the oh, shows no, the they wrote. Yeah. Um, so, so they were all different. You know, we knew we wanted a wide variety and we would say to them, like at the beginning, we were like, okay, we probably need like a mystery. You know, we probably need like a, a fantasy sci-fi something, you know, could we do a romance? So John sued, I was talking to him on his porch in Maine and he was like, you know, you know, love letters are so popular. What if we did a romance? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, what if the, the actor is writing to the uh, audience member and the audience member is the other person involved in the romance. And they start writing love letters to each other. And we were like, oh my gosh, that's like a little 
edgy. That yeah. seems a little like burlesque nightclub world. Um, but we put it on sale and it sold not as well as the others, but it, it sold <laughs> some tickets. And the audience is loving yes, it. Yes, it, it, it's uh, it, it's the audience is crazy for it. it. It's also the most the most interactive of the six shows. It involves a phone call. Um, so you know, it was one of the things we're playing with is how, how else can we use this form. But so a you, phone you call can't... from an actor, you, you receive yes. a phone call. From... Yes. Oh, wow. Yes, you can't you can't sign up for that one unless you are willing to be on the phone or well, it honestly, it doesn't work. Um, but it works brilliantly with the phone call. Um, and I will say with all six of the writers, some of them, we came to them with, with more of an idea of what we were looking for. But for, across the board, we were looking for folks who were, um, well, already we knew they were brilliant writers. So they were all people in some way in our circle, because uh, who was gonna, going to jump in with us with this brand new, we don't know how it works thing. Okay. Um, uh, but we sort of wanted to find something that all of them had real, a real spark to write, uh, because you have the motivation to figure out how was this seven letter art going to work. So, uh, you know, we had, we knew we, when we went to a Lin Kwan, for example, I said, I know I need a young audience piece. I think this is a great way to get kids off screens. Um, so I, we, I went to her with that, uh, and she got excited specifically about a sci-fi. So they, they, they are, they are, they are wildly different, which mm -hmm. of course is a challenge for us, right? Because the market's a little bit different for who wants to play. There's some crossover. Um, so, you know, to launch a brand new company, no one's heard of in a form that isn't, hasn't, you know, been out there. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the, that that hidden slipstream, the young audience by Lin Kwan, has also been very popular. In fact, a school reached out, and a fifth grade class at a school in New York uh, bought it as their sort of like field trip. So now we have all the kids in this fifth grade class writing letters um, to, you know, handwriting these letters to the character. The characters writing them back and taking them on all these stories. And with all these puzzles and that went and ciphers. Um, I also want to talk about Ida. So Ida B, Ida is, by November is where you write Ida B. Wells and you're writing her right in reconstruction, right post-Civil War. And it's sort of right before she became famous and what her sort of uh, story was during that time is she decided to pursue the life of an investigative journalist fighting for um, racial equality and civil rights. Uh, and it's really brilliant. And it's so we have this historical thing where you're writing a character from the past. We have this fantasy thing. We have this romance thing. Waxbox is like a mystery treasure. Treasure noir. hunt slash 80s nostalgia. Yeah. Which is or the one I which is the one I signed up for. Yes. I, I bought yes. a, a subscription to the Waxbox. And uh, it's been so I, I was attracted to it because of that 80s nostalgia. It just seemed right up my they all did really, but that was the one that spoke to me. Uh, and it's been super fun. Um, uh, I know I, I just recently moved, so we had a little hiccup uh, with the mail because I forgot to change my address and <laughs> we're figuring it out. But um, that's, you know, that's the nature of this kind of theater. Uh, but it's so much fun learning characters that the playwright has created and then kind of adding to it myself and deciding which way to like respond. So it's, it's really exciting. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at some questions going on. Yes, here. I really wanted to bring that up. Andrew asked about how you manage it all and if you have a maximum capacity for each so show. We, we do. do. So at <laughs> we this, do, we do. this first season, because we wanted to make sure we figured it out, we maxed each ticket at 50 uh, tickets per show. Uh, for the next, for season two, we're going to double that. So we're going to allow 100 tickets per show. And of course, we're expanding to more shows. We're going to do eight shows next season. Um, you can get on the waiting list right now if you go to our website artisticstamp.com and you sign up you'll you'll get on the waiting list and you'll find out about these shows becoming available before we announce it to the general public let's talk about the actors and uh -huh. then we'll then we'll, then andrew will explain more about how um how it all works behind the curtain um so this is most of our cast it's actually not all of them we've got 30 actors and everyone says, well, well, what do the actors do? Well, so the, the playwrights have developed these the, the arc of these stories, including many branches. Um, and the actors uh, are the ones actually handwriting the letters and they improv. So based on how you respond, they respond directly to you and, and thread that back into the story. Um, and depending on how, how the audience uh, member responds. The improv can be can be quite demanding of them, um, or you know sometimes it's a, it's a simple reply. You know I I choose to follow the tractor tracker <laughs> tracker um, in the fantasy, or I choose this branch. You know, and then they 
take you on that way. Um, but sometimes people share um, deeply personal things. Sometimes people, um, you know, take the story in a in a kind of what I call rogue direction, and then the actor uh, has to really work to get that on track. So, so part of how we're managing this is it, still it's massive for us, right? Because we are. Um, uh, in contact with all these actors and all these playwrights regularly, but we ourselves are not um, mailing out all of those letters. We The way it works behind the scenes is we receive them. All the letters come here to South Carolina. Uh, so every day I go to the post office and get you know between 10 and 20 letters. And then I upload them, which we'll go into later, uh, uh, and basically e email them out to the actors. So then the actor has your reply and then the actor as the character writes a letter to you and they send from wherever they are. And we have actors all over the country. We even have some in Canada for Canadian audience members. Yep, and that's that's key, right? When the actors are improving, they're improving in the voice of the character. So it's not like you're hearing from Ida and then someone else is saying, you know, I don't know, some casual uh, modern something. They are continuing to speak in the voice of the character. That's a huge part of their job. So they're improving, but improving in character. So this is where it goes kind of back to the clown thing I was talking about. You know, you have, it's like an audience volunteer. You kind of have your beginning, middle and end, but how, what the audience brings into it is gonna color how you get to those places. Um, except for some stories are also kind of choose your own adventure where the playwright, like Shelley says, is created like several different branches, you know, do you go to her house or do you go, you know, over here to inspect the backyard? Well, that leads you to different places, you know? Wow. And I'm, uh, so we have a question from Andrew and then I have a question myself as well. Um, but he's asking if it's hard to balance out the work among the actors and do, like, do some characters get a lot more letters than others or? Uh, that is true. So we initially assigned, the idea was we would do 50 tickets per show and five actors per show. So each actor would be interacting with 10 audience members. And again, this was in the beginning just to keep things small and keep things in a way we could do great customer relations. If things got off, if letters got lost in the mails, we figured this out, we could talk individually to all of our audience members. Um, and now some, that means each actor was assigned only one show. So they're all playing the same character over and over again with the audience members. No actors are doing two shows, uh, two titles, I guess you could say. Um, the, some shows did sell better than others. Like we said, Slipstream sold out and the romance had less tickets. So the actors on the romance have less audience members that they're corresponding with than the actors on, say, the, the TYA show. Uh, but within, I, I don't want to give it away too much, but within several of the shows, there is something that I'll call a guest letter. So you've been dealing with uh, one character that's whose story you're hearing. You might suddenly hear from another character in that story who might, you know, um, lay some doubt in terms of the, how much you can trust the person you've been interacting with, or they, there are different reasons that they come into the picture. So at that moment, then an actor suddenly is interacting with a different audience member within their same story, but they're trading. Um, we do have one married couple, um, which is uh, Megan Bartle and Chris Thorne. Um, they're actually side by side in that uh, end of that second row. But anyway, so um, th that's interesting to see that what they're learning from each other's audience members. And there, you know, there will be a point where they switch um, and are writing to each other's audience members. So. Um, and Stephen asks um, if, uh, does that mean the audience members then get more out of it? If there's less participants, is there more interaction? I, I think they think it's multi. No, everyone, every audience member is getting sort of the same amount of dedication from the actor. They're getting sort of the same amount of time as the actor. It just means that some actors are sort of working more hours in the week, basically. Um, the, uh, the other fun thing about this casting is we realized as we were doing it that you're not looking at the uh, actor at all. Right. So how, you know, we realized there was more flexibility in casting than we had before. So we have some men playing very female characters, some female playing very male characters, uh, and the audience would never know until the very end when we think we're going to do sort of a little bows and say, you know, thank you for going on this journey. Your role was played by. <laughs> wow. And so, and how did you then cast this, right? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, it, it's, it, you don't look at the photo and be like, that's the perfect this person, it doesn't matter. Oh, they had to submit handwriting samples. Wow. Um, so because, you know, a certain um, Waxbox, the series that you're on, wants to look quite different 
you know, than um, consolation melody. Consolation melody. Yeah. Wow. So it's more, the handwriting is how you express yourself. That's what we're seeing. And the handwriting really is expressive, Brian. I mean, I realize the way an actor writes a line um, is as, uh, has as much meaning as the way an actor speaks a line. And yeah. two actors given the same line if, can write it very differently and it can mean entirely different things. You know, one can be in very nice cursive with very thin slanting lines and one can be in like, you know, the script of an ax murderer. <laughs> You're like, oh my gosh. And, and <laughs> Do you I, think anyone is, is changing their handwriting to be in character? Yes, like, a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, because because they're intuiting kind of what the what the letters demand of them as well but we tried to put them on the right series and i will say across the board we were looking for actors who were game obviously flexible humor key do you know i mean i would say in every series in some way you have to have that ability um to have a light touch um and let lightness in i, I should say uh in, when you're uh, dealing with your audience but some of them need more of that than others. So that factored into it. And some of them have doodling and in the margins and some of them have like the way, you know, certain words are highlighted and they look more magical and things. Yeah, I mean, we sort of just discovered otherwise coming from an otherworldly power really needed a more, needed more visual impact. Um, and so we actually have learned a lot from this this season and we'll factor more of that into casting next season rather uh, than wax box which you're on where that guy you know just barely got his ged and does not write all that well right yeah it's, he, it's writes some of it is, he writes but no i mean his handwriting he doesn't his, yes, handwriting, his handwriting is, is not right so, yeah some of it actually about. i'm like what is that word oh i think <laughs> i figured it out but that's part of the fun yes. uh, we have a few we have a few comments and questions a andrew uh very funny uh he says penmanship will now have to be taught at juilliard uh, <laughs> Which, uh, which makes me realize, because I have terrible handwriting, you'd never cast me in any of these shows. No, I, Brian, I also would not be cast. Yeah. So Brian, okay. Waxbox would be your best bet. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll work for that. And then we have a few other questions. Uh, Howie asks, um, really interesting, do the audience members ever get the chance to interact with each other? Or is it strictly with the actor to whom he or she is? In the, uh, the, the current shows that we have, they do not. We are in development for a future series that will provide for that. Um, for the moment, the logistics of that felt beyond what we felt confident we could ensure, you know, that someone wouldn't drop out or, or how that would work. But we are in development on a, not for season two, but a future season that will have that option because people are hungry. People are hungry for connection across the board, which is part of why um, I think we've had such a great response. Uh, and because this really allows them to, to have that and, and also to get, have something to look forward to um, coming in the mailbox, that's not a bill. But, uh, <laughs> yes. but we, but we want to expand on that, um, that, that possibility for connection and, and more interaction. So we're working on a series down the road that ah, will allow for that. So stay tuned. Uh, and Elaine also asks um, about how long does the production itself last and how many Wait. back and forth Mail yeah, it's a in the mail. great question. So it's four months right now. Um, it, it's either six to seven letters that you receive over a four month period. The idea is that you receive a letter every three weeks uh, so that you have time to receive it, time to write back, and then time for it to get back to us and get to the actor. Yeah. So another thing, you know, about this, we realized that the letter itself becomes your set. So the scenic design of the stationery and the envelope and the handwriting becomes how we sort of communicate the world in which these characters live. Uh, for Ida B. Wells, you know, she, she's writing in cursive in a, you know, a, a slant that should look like letter writing from the 1800s on sort of brown paper that has a feeling from back then. The uh, love letter show is this sort of over here to the right with the flowers on it and everything. That's much more of a, um, you know, sort of flirtatious type envelope. Um, slipstream, she's traveling. And so she grabs paper wherever she can. And so we have a lot of paper with different letterheads on it from different companies or stores that she just went in and grabbed things and are sort of furiously giving it out to you. Um, and we give props too. So you can see this is sort of barrage flowers that come out of one of the series. Every series has at least a couple of letters that have some prop that is sent with them. And sort of what we discovered about the props, it's, it's, it's less about like sending you trinkets and more about sending a, an item that's meaningful to the story, right? So it's not like 
I don't know, um, the gold coin or the gem or something. I don't, I don't even know what that would be, but whatever it is wants to feel why it feels important is because it's integral to your, the story that you're being told and that you're participating in. We're getting, Brian, it's all given circumstances. We're learning more and more that, you know, design the paper, the prop, everything must come from, well, where are these characters? What world are they in? What would they have available to them? What can sort of increase the dramatic storytelling of the event? Yeah. Uh, Cindy says that her 101-year-old grandmother makes her own stationery with pressed flowers and that she always loves getting letters and cards from her on that stationery. So. Oh, wow. I love that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Shelly's playing on season two uh, with a letter that they wouldn't be pressed flowers, but she has been painting flowers and trying to put like the flowers on the letter. So then when you received it, it would have sort of a bunch of flowers that had the, the outline of them in paint had been all over the stationery you received oh wow i mean it's it's also appropriate to say that we are you know have cooked this all up out of our living room so um do you know i mean it, it, um uh the there there's something the story is always forward it's it's we're really storytellers it's a, it's about the play so um certainly we want to have be specific in all of our choices um, but, you know, it's not a big, massive company that has put this out. It's, you know, two theater directors enlisting um, and trying to put to work a lovely group of playwrights and a, and a nice, robust group of actors. So I just that's sort of the heart of, of, of what this company is. Yeah, what people respond to is the interaction, being seen, writing to someone, being a part of the story, um, you know, really having a pen pal friend. It, it's like it's like having your own private playwright creating a pen pal adventure for you. And it's and it's um it's immersive and it takes you to another place, which is something that during these times we're all, you know, whether it's Netflix all night long or it's this constant like oh thought of who what's the next letter going to bring, you know? I mean, it, yeah. it takes you somewhere that is transportive, which is nice. Um, and so these um, are some of the actors, right? These are some of the actors doing the writing. So like we said, they, you know, each of them has to get out 10 letters, uh, really sort of every couple of weeks and receive 10 letters and write back. And they come from all over. We have, because of this and because COVID, so many people left New York City. Um, so many actors, theater workers, directors, and they moved back with parents or with family or to their hometown. Um, and through this, we're able to give them all jobs. So normally when we're casting a show, Shelly and I are like, okay, well, who's in New York? You know, or it's in LA. Well, who's in LA? And this was like, oh, it doesn't matter. Who do we like? Oh, I think they moved to Kansas. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. Um, uh, these are some of the <laughs> audience members that so now people are posting on Facebook we're halfway through and you can see in the corner here one of the actual letters so this is from Ida B. Wells and it's to uh, an audience member named Fiona and you can see that she writes you know her name it's Fiona she's telling her her story you can see the date uh, 1884 uh, over there and this in the middle is Fiona so you can see Fiona reading that letter from Ida, and then you can see her response. You know, dear Ida, I think you should do this. Uh, please write me back soon, Fiona. Um, these are other images of audience members. We, we love these because we get photos of the kids that aren't staged. You know, these are parents snapping pictures of them reading letters. But of course, all of our adult audience members, <laughs> it's all them, you know, doing selfies with the envelopes. <laughs> But I, this right here in cap, I mean, this is what one of the things that's so important about this project, right? I mean, it's, I don't know if I've ever seen photos of kids these age today looking not at their phones, right? It's, it's really nice to see how gross they are in these letters. You know, it's true. I think, you know, the parents shared them because they were so excited. They were not on the screen and they were all in um, kind of tearing through the letters, excited to be part of it. So um, yeah, we, we, had some lovely responses. <laughs> um, there was a question. Uh, so some of the audience have gotten really into this and have written us back with letters, honestly, more beautiful than letters we're sending out. We're getting fan art. We're getting letters that are hand painted. This letter here in the middle, um, this lady 
paints her letters, uh, and then she sends them back to us with these beautiful, uh, you know, envelopes and stationery that she creates from scratch. Wow. Uh, over in the corner, that little Nintendo, that's from a wax box that you're on. They said, you know, back then I played Nintendo all the time and then drew this controller and sent it to us. Um, uh, but, you know, th those are sort of, we love getting their amazing when these come in the mail, um, but most just write on these postcards we send. So we give you a postcard uh, with that's been pre-addressed and pre-stamped to mail back. And in the corner, that's what one of those postcard audience replies look like. So that they're sort of writing back, um, you know, telling what to do, beginning that conversation. Uh, I just want to share what Andrew said. He says, get this project into the COVID stimulus, a new WPA for theater professionals. <laughs> Let's make it happen. <laughs> um, so Andrew had a question about how it all works. This is a, a little video that I'll just do for a bit. Um, but basically, this sort of shows you how it works. This is a, a portal that, that uh, George Joachim, our general manager, created. And when we bring the letters in, uh, I'll sort of play this and you'll see. Where you want to look at is letters needing reply. Uh, I'm going to click on letters needing reply, and that will take me to this page where I'll be able to see the letters that are assigned to me as an actor that I need to reply to, or assigned to Orson Welles. Uh, in this, the story PDF file is just the blurb, so we're going to ignore that, and I want you to come over here um, and go to action with a little carrot. You click the carrot and click view letters, and that will take you to the letters you need to write. Again, story file is just the blurb, so you come over here to letter file, and when you click letter file, it's going to download the letter currently in there. So I will update these every couple of weeks. Right now, it's all letter one. When the postcard comes in, I'll upload the postcard and change this to letter two. So then when you come in, you'll be able to see uh, what the playwright has given you to put into letter two. Right now, we have letter one. So I'll take this. I'll copy it down. I'll come back, and I'll see my audience. My audience is Dashiell Clay Hyler. Um, so this is sort of a how-to video that I made for um, the actors so that they would be able to know what, you know, how this all works, but it gives you a sense of what the portal is. That we, the letters come here, I upload them to the portal, uh, and then the actors put their handwritten letter up, uh, and then I put the audience's reply up. So what that means is we have it all saved. If anything gets lost in the mail, if you are an audience member that suddenly decides to go on vacation in Turks and Caicos, uh, I can take the letter that was sent to you and get it to you uh, so that everyone is aware. And what we're instituting in season two is that the audience will get notifications. So as soon as your letter is received, uh, your, you know, your reply, you'll get a text message. And as soon as we mail you a new letter, you'll get a text message. Or an email. Or an email. So you'll know sort of what's coming and when to expect it and, you know, how long it took to get to us and all of that. We, we had developed that partly, or uh, we're in the process of developing that because um, our audience got so into it that they got anxious. Um, you know, did Vega get my letter? Did, uh, uh, you know, or I'm worried that, you know, or, or is my letter coming? Um, and because also, uh, um, honestly, in figuring it out at the beginning, we, um, there were a lot of issues with, we had to learn about the post office. So we had a couple of um, bumps in the very first exchange that where we had to, you know, we had to learn some new things. So um, the calendar wasn't smooth at the very top. Now it's working beautifully, uh, but the, you know, they are, they are hungry. They want to know that we, that their character is hearing back from them and they want to know their letters on the way. So um, it took, took a little uh, technology exploration, but that is in the works. We, Andrew, uh, we love this Christmas present idea. We are really pushing that. So like I say, if you go on to uh, artisticstamp.com, uh, you can sign up for our waiting list right now, and you'll be the first to know when tickets go on sale, and you can gift it. Uh, so it'll say, you know, the name of the buyer and the name of the recipient, and we won't send the recipient an email um, until the first letter goes out, but you will have a choice to either have a letter sent that is like something you can put under the tree, or uh, just an email sent that then you can forward and let them know. Uh, tickets are $99 for a four-month adventure. And you can pay it upfront, or it can be split into four installments of $25 a month. Uh, so you can do it sort of in a sub subscription basis or into one upfront payment. Um, <clears throat> I, I wanted to ask about directing because that's where your, you know, both of you guys or your background is. And West, in that video, I could see some directing happening there. How much, like, how much more? 
directing was there? I certainly, you know, as an actor coming into this new form of theater, you know, I don't know how to do it. Like what, how did that go? Yeah, well, I think it's a couple of things. I mean, one is so, as directors, we're often dramaturgical. So working hand in hand with a playwright in terms of the development of the story. Uh, so that's a huge portion of it. But then uh, in terms of working with the actors, I think it's been different on each piece. Um, some of it we had to, you know, look at their, we are, look, we are looking at everything right now. Um, and so, you know, if they are, they are not actively listening, uh, which is something you know that's the best the best acting on right it's the best acting on stage right it's not sure. you're just performing and you're not taking in what you're being given um it's not very interesting right it doesn't ring true uh, and it's actually a hundred percent the same thing here mm -hmm. so if they're just doing what they're doing and they're not really listening to their audience member it doesn't work um so they've as we've discovered that they've all been really re receptive to that uh, and also just honing in the voice that they're responding with as well uh, to make sure it's it's in the character realm. And then some of it's developed. It's like, oh, this character maybe doodles more. How do they express themselves? And encouraging that. Um, again, otherwise that we mentioned, which is the otherworldly piece that has where uh, you have the audience perform magic at home. Um, they, uh, not magic like David Copperfield. No, more, real, more, like, more like Wiccan. Wiccan totally. magic, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you do but, spells in your, in your living room. Oh, yes. cool. <laughs> yes, um, but, but uh, sort of directing them in terms of the, the feel and the, and, the, and the style of what that might look like. Yeah. Um, I also, we were talking, I think last night or the night before, and uh, it occurred to me, you know, this is, a, this is, you have an audience member for four months, very different than having an audience member for two or three hours. So, um, and I made the joke that you don't have to, you know, there's no, you don't have to worry about a, a loud audience member or someone whose phone keeps going off, right? Um, but have there been, you had a, a something, Shelly, you told a story to me about yes. an audience member that sort of went rogue through yes. these letters, which was exciting, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, again, it's us, we're learning and um, what's the right prompt to, 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 Oh, I'll say first that we thought we had to work really hard to uh, get the audience to respond. And that hasn't been the case. They, you know, um, we, we made the postcard. It's already got postage on it. Make it as easy in everybody's life as possible. Really have the, the, the character asking them to be involved. But that, that has not been a, a problem. Um, but guide rails in terms of how to play each one is something that we, we um, sort of had to develop and learn about. So one uh, audience member essentially um, killed off the main character. So they responded to the letter. Um, I, I, I sort of just give you enough to have some context, but they, they they responded to the letter and they wrote to the character's parents and said, I was so sorry, you know, to hear about what happened to him. And, you know, he was a beautiful person. And, you know, so suddenly we're like, oh gosh, we have six letters ahead about this character from this character and they've killed them off. So <laughs> it's it's run the gamut, you know, yeah. some audience members play as fictional characters, some don't want to have their names, you know, some audience members are, write very personal responses and are really being vulnerable in this um, and sharing things with the uh, characters who then are, you know, responding with a, a strong ear and care and, um, and compassion. Um, and then there are some audience members who you know, are trying out new things. Some people in the fall in love play are, you know, pairing with uh, other genders that they haven't been with in their life before that point. So it really allows for you to role play or be yourself, yeah. uh, you know, have a true connection, have something that you're playing a fictional character and you're acting in it as well. It's up to you yeah. to create the experience you want. Yeah, it's really incredible. And there's been a lot of comments in the, in the chat box. Um, I know Cindy, uh, Cindy said that she thinks many of us feel a certain nostalgia when we receive letters. Her grandfather wrote fictional stories and chapters to her when she was eight or 10 years wow. old. And she received yeah. that every month or two and it was such a treat. And it, this reminds her of how exciting it was to find out what would happen next, right? It's I, that think, I think that actually, you know, one thing that Shelley and I, going back to what is liveness and what we miss about theater, one thing that we really believe is that theater creates empathy. And that when you go to a show, you see a character on stage and you live inside their shoes, even if it's a very different world from yours, and you start to empathize with them and see the world as if it's happening to you. 
And I don't know that that happens as much in Zoom readings or in film or TV, honestly. I think theater has, you know, we win at that. But there's something about this letter writing process because you're receiving letters from this character over four months and they're talking about their lives that you really feel like they become your friend and you really feel connected to them in a very empathetic, emotional way. Um, it's pretty amazing. It's, I mean, it's what we're always trying to do, right? When in the best plays, in the, in, in, in the stories that we're telling, we're trying to sort of put you in someone's shoes or make you feel something or make you see the world from a slightly different perspective. And he, this gave us the opportunity that you, you to directly correspond with that person, you, there's, you have no choice but to see their, their worldview. Um, and it, you know, it, maybe it shifts yours or opens yours or brings you that uh, extra joy. Um, how he was talking about letters from um, World War II, which is, is amazing. And your daughter in that experience, right, is, is getting a window into that, both that relationship and also, you know, that, that moment in time. Uh, and so really getting to kind of be immersed in what that world uh, might have been like. We're, we're playing, we're trying to play with this a bit. You know, we have Ida, which is a historical one. Uh, next season, we have a series that's going to take place in Shanghai. And so you're going to hear from that person and what he's experiencing in that culture. Um, and we have a series that is going to be in a, a sort of Shakespearean world. We have a series oh. that's going to take place in the forest of Midsummer Night's Dream about 20 years after the events happened. Oh, very cool. Those haven't been announced. But again, if okay. you sign up for the waiting list, <laughs> you'll hear about it before anyone else. Uh, and Elaine asked, where and how do you advertise for this? How did you find your audience right away? Well, we only did it through our personal mailing list. You know, I was lucky because I was the artistic director of the New York Musical Festival. So I had a pretty big mailing list of theater lovers from that. And then we had all of our, and you know, and I had produced Diorama a musical I did before. So I've sort of developed a mailing list over these shows. Um, and then we had all of our own friends and our 20 years experience in the theater world. And uh, we were fortunate to draw a lot of um, lovely press I mean, because there's not, maybe partly because there's not a lot happening in the theater and also people are hungry for something to happen, but we, we, um, we have a lovely press rep as well, but we, um, the press helped us a lot. And people who are reading newspapers actually are, you know, are, are, are often great candidates for this. Yes, you know? Katie um, Rosen, who did our press, she got us a blurb in the New York Times, um, American Theater did an article on us, Broadway World did a couple of articles on us, uh, DC Metro, and all of those certainly helped get the word out. You know, and a cast of 30 doesn't hurt um, as a first launching point. Sure. Uh, you know, it, it's fair to touch on the, um, Brian, that, you know, we have been directors, uh, uh, West spent time um, running NIMF, but outside of that, we've really been freelance directors for a very long time. So producing is new to us. So, you know, the marketing, all, you know, all of the um, becoming Instagram savvy, that is actually where we've had to stretch and grow the most, you know, we're really um, storytellers at heart. So, um, but COVID kind of pushed us a little out of our comfort zone to say, you know, we have this idea and we believe in it enough to want to push it out into the world. So we're going to sort of kind of stretch our skills and uh, try our hand at all of that. Yeah, well, you know, certainly if there's a positive during all this the pandemic, it's, it's stories like this and ideas like this. And I'm sure that this will continue once theater is back live. I mean, why not? You know, people will still have this need for interaction and the mail will still be there, hopefully. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm sure. But, yeah, we um, we do think it will have a life beyond, you know, we're figuring out the form now in a way that's exciting and that, you know, it will still be phenomenal to get something, to have something to look forward to that comes in the mail, um, even when we return to our full interactive lives. Yeah. Well, uh, be sure everyone to check out artisticstamp.com. Uh, get on the mailing list because season two is, is very soon, right around the corner, right? Yeah, and season two. Tickets will publicly go on sale November 30th and uh, they'll be on sale through to December 31st. And then the first letters will be sent January 4th. Great. Well, this is, I, I, I hope that, I mean, I, you know, I've been uh, subscribed since you guys launched this um, and knew a little bit about this, but um, talking with you and learning about the ins and outs and the ideas behind it is, is super fascinating and inspiring. And uh, based on the comments, I think everyone who's, uh, who's here right now agrees with that. Um, and we're going to post this for people to watch uh, later on. There's a bunch of 
final comments. If anyone has any other questions before we um, we, we wrap up here, but uh, Andrew wanted to add that he's played some uh, Choose Your Own Adventure Twitter threads, which some museums have created during the pandemic. Uh, and it's very complicated to set up, but a pretty cool way to use the format. And this reminded him of that. Yeah. Um, and Elaine uh, mentions a wonderful book by Echo Heron called Noon at Tiffany's based on the letters written between 1888 and 1944. Yeah, we sort of, you know, we sort of took Griffin and Sabine as a little bit of uh, inspiration early on, if you guys know that book. I don't, but we'll have to. Griffin and Sabine, yeah. Yeah, check that out. And uh, we dropped in the, the websites, uh, West's website, Shelley's website, and of course, Artistic Stamp. Uh, but thank you all so much for joining us. West and Shelley, thank you. This is, as always, so fascinating, inspiring talking to you guys. Um, and uh, yeah, and thanks everyone else. Uh, uh, join us later in the week, uh, tomorrow and, and later on for our future programs. And be sure to subscribe to season two of Artistic Stamp. I know I'm going to be getting my tickets uh, for a new experience. So uh, thanks again. And thanks for everything you guys are doing. It's really, uh, really inspiring. Thank you, Brian, thanks, for having us on. Thanks, Brian. And thanks to your audience for all of the great questions and for being so interactive and involved. <laughs> I feel like you're here. That's the kind us, of so. audience member we want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. You too. Bye. Take care.